Thank you. You may be seated. I hope we have many more years of freedom here in the United States. I wonder if this will be our last, the last time that together we'll be able to speak about the freedom that we have and the freedom particularly that we have in Christ. Our freedoms are very quickly being removed from us and it's rather significant that as we go into this 4th of July weekend, we saw all the things that were happening around us. We participated in a parade yesterday. Went to some fireworks last night, quite beautiful, very nice. But realizing how many people don't understand freedom. How many of the young people sitting around us in the grandstands have no concept of what went on in the world wars or in the Korean War or the Vietnam War what's happening today with the erosion of liberty here in this country the things that our forefathers died for the religious freedom that we have so much enjoyed for 240 years almost at this point freedom in Christ as you know, our scripture reading that we read just a few moments ago was from Romans chapter 6. In Romans 6, Paul gives the theological explanation of what Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees in John chapter 8. They're both talking about the same thing. You see exact parallels between John chapter 8 and Romans chapter 6. And so that we may better understand our freedom in Christ, I want to read a few verses also out of John chapter 8. They're very familiar verses. Most of those verses you probably know from heart. Perhaps you've never connected them with the mighty doctrinal passage of Romans chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spake these words... Now listen to this next phrase. It's very important to understanding what happens in the rest of the passage. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. We know about the unbelievers later in the passage, but Jesus is addressing believers in this passage and he's going to be talking to them about the foundation of their freedom. Others are listening in, others respond improperly, but he's talking to believers about the freedom, the liberty that belongs to them. And you know verse 32. If you continue, I'll read verse 31 completely, I only read part of it. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication, 
We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory, that there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him, and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Freedom. Freedom certainly is an appropriate theme for this week as we remember the freedom that God has given here in the United States. We've just celebrated the American Independence Day. And it's with grateful thanksgiving that we, as the United States citizens, look back to 1776 and the establishment of our country as an independent nation. Two years ago, at just this exact same time, I had just returned from a foreign land that is under the totalitarian domination of atheistic communism. That's where I helped my daughter and her husband adopt two tiny children. It was, in a sense, a rescue operation to save two castaway children from death, oppressive authoritarianism, miserable lives, pagan philosophy, evolutionary indoctrination, and a vacuum where they would probably never hear the gospel. Returning to the United States made me realize just how blessed we are to have the political, economic, social, and religious freedom that we so much enjoy here in this place. But our Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul in these two passages that we've just read speak of an even more valuable freedom in the book of John and in the book of Romans. 
The two passages that we just read deal with people who are truly free versus people who are under the heavy hand of sin. The oppressive bonds of legalism, the enslaved domination of trying to earn salvation or sanctification by the works of the law, slavery to the world, the flesh, and the devil. I think it's interesting to notice that in the passage in John, Jesus is principally addressing new believers. You saw that, the first two verses I read, verse 30 and 31. It emphasizes that these are new believers. It's interesting because it's new believers who often fall prey to the tools of bondage that once enslaved them. The Pharisees are also on the scene like hungry wolves trying to devour the newborn lambs. It's to believers, verse 30, then spake he these words, many believed on him. Verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. He's talking about freedom, verse 33, ye shall be made free. He's talking about slavery, verse 34, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. He's talking about who can make you free in verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. An appropriate passage for Independence Day weekend. So we look at the first freedom that Jesus promises is the freedom from sin in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sins is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What's your context? <laughs> it's freedom from bondage to sin. People try all kinds of things to relieve themselves of that guilt feeling that they've got. They know that there's something wrong. They try drugs. They try sex. They try go into a shrink, some kind of a psychiatrist, some of them dabble in the occult. They try all kinds of things to get rid of that painful feeling that they've got in the back of their mind that something is wrong. The something that's wrong is sin. There's only one place where you find freedom from sin. Where you move into the glorious light of liberty and that is in Christ. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What is it that's tying you up? What bondage do you have in your life? What is it that's holding you down and stretching you out and breaking you in half and holding you back from doing what you know is right? It all falls under one category. A three-letter word. Sin. S-I-N. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Freedom from the slavery of sin comes when you really know the truth. It's the same context. Did you remember what we just read? Verse 32. <laughs> Verse 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, if you try anything except what God says is the truth, it will not lead you to freedom. In that context, we just read about it. The devil gives all kinds of manipulative tools. He gives all kinds of alternative paths. He promises you freedom and glorious freedom and enjoyment. But all of it leads to chains. If you trust anything except the word of God, if you trust anything except the truth, you will not be free. It's impossible. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now let's compare that with Romans 6, which we read as our scripture reading this morning. Freedom from sin is exactly the point that Paul is making in Romans chapter 6. Jesus had just talked about whosoever could have sinned is a servant of sin. Now look what Paul says in Romans 6.16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. It sounds like he's quoting Jesus out of John chapter 8. But there's a lot more than that. Freedom from sin is the point that Paul is making in Romans 6. 
And he goes on in verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. That's truth. That doctrine is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's why we can get to verse 18 in Romans 6. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. A total 100% transformation, a 180 degree turnaround from the way you were going, no longer under the slavery of sin, but now you have a wonderful master. And you're free to do righteousness. You could not do righteousness in the flesh. Did you know that? Paul says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Whatever you try to do in the flesh will never, never end in righteousness. Never. Not once. Not ever. If it's in the flesh, it will not end in righteousness. Because you're the slave of sin. When you walk in the flesh, you fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's only as you walk in the Spirit of God. Both Jesus and Paul in these two passages give us the principal boundaries of true Christian liberty. Freedom from sin that releases our chains, not just so that we can run around and do our own thing. It releases our chains so that we can serve Christ. You know, as we look at these two passages, there are three sets of contrary systems that are involved in that struggle. The first system expounded by both Jesus and Paul is the flesh versus the spirit. The flesh versus the spirit. That's a contrast between the two principal. Now, I'm going to give you some key words. I hope you can remember some of these. Flesh versus spirit. That deals with the two principal empowerments. Empowerments. That's your first key word. Empowerments that struggle for supremacy in the Christian life and our pursuit of freedom. What's the power by which you are trying to attain freedom in your Christian life? The Jews were counting on their physical heritage, that is the flesh, for their right relationship with God. Did you see it in verse 33? They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? That's the flesh, folks. Hey, I'm a descendant from George Washington. Look at me. Really? And are you president? No. <laughs> Don't count on the flesh. There are so many people that are very, very interested in their genealogical records. You know, it's interesting, but that's not where it's at. You have to have a personal relationship with Christ. Don't count on your genealogical records. I'll be speaking, Lord willing, in the Dean Bergen meetings about the Mormon holy books versus the King James Bible. The King James Bible is the official Bible of Mormonism. Did you know that? But they have all kinds of very strange things that they've added from their other holy books. And one of the things they love is genealogical research. Because when they do genealogical research, then they run over to 1 Corinthians 15 and jerk a verse out of its context, completely not what it means about baptism for the dead, and they run out and after they find all these dead relatives from generations past, they go out and get baptized for them so they can get saved. Oh, dear friends, counting on the flesh, that's the first problem. The two principal empowerments, the flesh or the spirit. The Jews in verse 33 are emphasizing the flesh. Jesus replies to them in verses 37 and 38. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. Let's get back to real roots. Let's get back to the spiritual roots behind it. You're talking Abraham. I'm talking God and the devil. You want to go back to the fact that you're physically related to Abraham. I want you to understand that there is a spiritual warfare going on here. And it's not a matter of your flesh. It is a matter of your relationship with either God or Satan. Now, folks, you're related to one of the two. In the spirit world, you're related to one of the two. No, not the Mormon way of being related. You are either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. 
Do you know for sure where you are? You see, there's a warfare. It's flesh versus the spirit. The word of Jesus is truth. Therefore, since they rejected his word, they were still in slavery. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You know why? Jesus explains it in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We find that Jesus himself later in that same passage, just two verses later, says this, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified through the truth. What you believe, folks, makes a great deal of difference in your relationship with the living God. Where a real freedom is found. So that's the first system. Flesh versus spirit, two principal empowerments. The second contrasting system that we see in John and Romans is the contrast between works and faith. That's a contrast between the two principal means. First was empowerment, now we're talking means. The two principal means that people follow in their pursuit of salvation or sanctification. Works versus faith. Jesus talks about it, so does Paul. Listen, John 8, 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, ye would do the... Is anybody following along? Ye would do the... Works. That's right. Ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth. There we are, back to truth again. That goes back to the Word of God. That goes back to the doctrine that Paul delivered to them in Romans 6. Their works proved their spiritual condition. Their works did not save them, but their works proved their spiritual condition versus the works of Abraham, which proved his faith. When Abraham is used in the New Testament, he is used as an example of faith. And his works prove his faith. The third set of contrasts that we see in these two passages is the contrast between law and grace. That's a contrast between the two principal motivations. There's your third key word. First, we looked at the empowerments, flesh versus the spirit. Second, we looked at means, works versus the flesh. Now we're looking at motivations, law versus grace. The contrast between the motivations that people follow in their desire to be justified and sanctified. Here what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we see it very clearly. Verses 1 and 2 and then verses 14 and 15. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So he's going to be talking about grace here. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Down to verse 14. If you know the truth, the truth makes you free. If you know the truth and really believe the truth, sin will no longer have its grip and power over you. It will no longer be your master. It will no longer control you. He started with grace. Now listen to what he says in verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. It's no longer your master. Freedom in Christ, knowing the truth, Freedom from the bondage of sin. You sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What shall we say then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. You see, exactly the same thing that Jesus is dealing with. He's dealing with a bunch of Jews who are under the law, who are looking back to Moses, who are looking back to Abraham, who are looking back to keeping the law and doing all the do good things so that they can think they can be right with God. Jesus says, you don't understand the spiritual relationship that you have to have with your father. You don't understand that when you have that relationship, it produces things in your life. And when you don't have that relationship, it produces other things in your life. Those are the results of what will happen if you try to follow the flesh, human good works, the law of Moses. It only results in the works of the flesh. In the case of Jesus in John 8, the works of the flesh that manifested themselves were the sins of the tongue. They gave him a bunch of cruel insults. 
They implied that he was born of an illegitimate relationship. The other works that manifested themselves were blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that in some detail in the past. And the attempted murder of Jesus. They picked up stones to stone him. Those are works of the flesh. <laughs> Listen to what they said. First, the insults. Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan. That was about the worst thing you could call somebody. Ah, oh, you're a Samaritan. <laughs> to us, that makes no difference. But the Samaritans were half-breeds. And to be called a Samaritan, you really insulted somebody. Because you were insulting at least one side of their family. They were a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Yuck. That's what they're saying to Jesus. Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil. That's the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. They've seen him perform miraculous signs. And Mark chapter 3 explains to us, and we've talked about that in detail, that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, for which man will never be forgiven, is attributing the works of Christ, when you've seen his miracles, to the power of Satan. Because they said, it says in Mark chapter 3, he hath the devil. That's what they're doing here. So we see the second thing that proves who their father is. And then the attempted murder, verse 59. They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why did they do it? Because if you follow Jesus' logic clearly and carefully, and if he speaks the truth, the only conclusion that you can come to is that Jesus Christ is God. And that's what he explains to them in great, great precision. You're not 50 years old, and you say you've seen Abraham? Now, remember, Abraham lived 2000 BC. Abraham lived 2000 years before Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Say, you're fi oh, not even 50 years old. No, he's about 30, but he probably, because of the way he talked, appeared to be much older to them. But we don't think you've gotten to 50 yet. And we know how long ago Abraham lived. You say, Abraham rejoiced to see my day he saw and was glad. You're not 50 years old. How can you make a statement like that? They're beginning to hone in on what he's about to tell them. And so Jesus says it plainly. Before Abraham was, ego emi. That's the Greek for I am, and it's emphatic. And they understood it because they knew Moses and they knew what had happened in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush where Moses stood before the burning bush and God said, take your sandals off, Moses. You're in my presence. And God revealed himself to Moses as, I am that I am hath sent thee. Thus shalt thou say unto Pharaoh, I am hath sent thee. And Jesus said to them, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to stone him. What an incredible, incredible lesson Jesus teaches us. And Paul is emphasizing this. You have one of two masters. Do you want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ just because he was a nice guy who sometimes, you know, walked on water at the Sea of Galilee? Or do you serve him because he is the way, the truth? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He's the living word. He is the life. <clears throat> The only conclusion that you can reach if you trust in Christ, that he is God come in the flesh. The Jews rejected the truth, and that's why they tried to murder him. In the same way, Paul talks about what the results are from walking in the flesh. Romans 6, back there again, these two parallel passages that we're looking at. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. 
For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. He's going to talk about the results in your life. Verse, next verse, verse 21. <clears throat> what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? Some of you got saved as teenagers or as adults. And as you think back to the time before you got saved, there are probably some things that you're ashamed of. Paul's talking about that. What kind of fruit did you have? What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. This is a war to the death, folks. They took up stones to stone Jesus. They wanted to kill him. But they were on the path of death themselves. The end of those things is death. In contrast, in verses 18 and 22, we see the results of what happens if you're under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. If you walk by faith, if you manifest grace and love, it always results not in the fruit of death, but it results in the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to what Paul says. This is in Romans. I know it's in Galatians, but he pulls about it, talks about it in Romans 6. Listen. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. But now being made free from sin, you became servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Okay. Now, I know I've talked some complex theology this morning. I think it's pretty clear. I think you see those parallels in John and Romans, and I hope you pick those up. But if you're sharp and if you've been paying attention, you immediately realize that this is the key theme of Paul's epistle to the Galatians as well. If you try to follow the flesh, if you try to save yourself through human good works and obeying the law of Moses, the only result that you will get is the works of the flesh and death, which is what we just read here in Romans 6. He calls us to liberty in Christ. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For ye, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then he asks the question. Now remember, Jesus is talking to new believers. Believers who are, being, who are surrounded by a bunch of wolves that like to devour these new little lambs. That's why they're trying to put Jesus on the spot with that series of questions. Paul writes to Galatians, who had had some wolves show up, who had had some wolves turn them aside from the freedom that they had in Christ. And that's why he asked the question, ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? A few verses later, for brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. That's that same contrast we saw Jesus making back there. The Spirit versus the flesh. Paul's making it here again in Galatians. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. When it finally clicks... When you begin to realize your position in Christ, it transforms your life. When that occurs, you'll see the results of true freedom in Christ. The Spirit of God will produce, not through your works, not through the flesh, not through false motivations. The Spirit of God will produce in and through your life the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, if that's your position, make it your practice. Let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory. Don't do it for wrong reasons. Provoking one another, envying one another. 
In this lies true Christian liberty. Now, if you don't get anything else out of this message, remember this thing. True Christian liberty is not a right. You know, true Christian liberty is not the right to do what we want to do. It is, going back to our first point today, it is the empowerment to do what we ought to do. Christians have no rights that we can demand from God. We turned all of our so-called rights over to God when we trusted Christ. After salvation, all of our rights are now subject to the will of God as revealed in the Word of God. And it's when we yield those rights to Him, that's where we find freedom. We're only free from sin when we're doing what God designed for us to do. We're not free when we're enslaved by sin. We're not free when we're indulging the flesh with wickedness. We're not free when we believe the lies of the devil and destroy our own lives. That's why Jesus told the unbelieving pack of Pharisees that had surrounded him as he was talking to these new believers that they were of their father the devil. We're not free when we're walking according to the course of this world, when we're walking in subjection to the prince of the power of the air. You're not free when you're doing that, folks. Our freedom comes when we allow the Spirit of God to lift us above the filth of the world. Just as the power of the fuel in the engines lifts the massive multi-ton airplane above the surface of the earth, we only have true liberty when we allow the Spirit of God to flow through us, cleansing us by the blood of Christ, empowering us to serve God with joy and the power of the Spirit of God. True liberty comes when by the power of the Spirit of God we do things that glorify God. When we are empowered by the Spirit and in obedience to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit never empowers us or motivates us to violate the word of God because thy word is truth. Every time we disobey the Bible, we're walking in the flesh. Disobedience to the Bible is not Christian liberty. That, by the way, gives us the definition of truly good works. Good works are not a matter of keeping the law of Moses in the power of the flesh to the glory of the Pharisee who happens to be doing the good work. Certainly there are no good works which violate the principles of the Word of God, even though the world may view humanly beneficial things as so-called good works. Some of you may remember that several years ago, <laughs> I still grimace as I think about this message, we had a missionary speaker here who was working among the poor in a third world country. And many of their children died from starvation. The missionary commented that the solution that these poor people needed was training in family planning and birth control, and that would solve their problems. I still groan as I remember that. <laughs> oh, really? What's the problem, folks? That's the solution offered by the world, the flesh and the devil. And all three wicked slime pits will say a hearty amen to the words of that missionary. Murdering babies by abortifacient drugs is not a glorious substitute for letting babies starve to death. Hey, let's kill them the other way. Hey, they're starving to death. Let's kill them first with abortion, with drugs. People, we need to start thinking like Christians if we want to experience true Christianity and true Christian liberty. Just because the world, the flesh, and the devil says you have the freedom to do something does not make it so. Legalism never brings liberty, but immoral license never brings liberty either. Libertinism brings you into bondage just as swiftly as legalism does. Both legalism and libertinism are both your deadly enemies. Both of them are enemies to true freedom in Christ. Remember, legalism is not merely the establishment of boundaries for right and wrong, because God has established boundaries. The world wants you to think that any boundaries are legalistic. They want you to ignore the fact that there is a higher authority than the world. God has established boundaries for right and wrong. 
Our spiritual enemies have tried to do two things. Number one, they've tried to blur the boundaries. And number two, they have tried to redefine the terms. Those are two areas where you have to be alert when you're doing spiritual battle. The legalist wants you to move the boundaries to require more than God requires in some area. For example, you go to various religions and they say, well, in order to get into heaven, you've got to say novenas and you've got to make a pilgrimage to Rome and you've got to crawl on your knees up the Scala Sancta and you've got to kiss the cross on the 13th step in the middle of that stairs, you know, and you'll get a double benefit from that. And, you know, you've got to do so many masses and light so many candles. Folks, it's adding stuff to the Word of God. The legalist requires more than God requires. But on the other hand, the libertine wants to move the boundaries to require less than God requires. Both try to redefine the terms of conflict so that either you must defend ground that God has not called you to defend, or you fail to defend the ground that God has called you to defend. True legalism is when someone requires so-called good works in order to either obtain salvation or obtain sanctification. And I emphasize obtain. You'll see why in a minute. Sometimes the legalists require you to keep the law of Moses for salvation or sanctification. Sometimes they require you to keep the works of man for salvation and sanctification. And I've given you some illustrations out of Roman Catholicism of that. But in the Bible, legalism is only when someone requires some kind of works either to obtain salvation or to obtain sanctification. That's a very important to remember when someone calls you a legalist. I've been called a legalist so many times it isn't even funny. I mean, incredible. All the way through high school. Even before high school. Even before I went away to Stony Brook. When I was 10, 11 years old, people called me a legalist. Because I read the Bible and I said, this is what it says, and that's the way I think I want to live. And they say, you legalist. I went off to, to high school on Long Island, a boys' school. And I wouldn't do some of the things that the other boys were doing, like sneaking out of the dorm at night. I said, you legalist. Climbing the water tower to paint things on the side of the water tower. And they did that. Yeah. <laughs> they did some things that were a lot worse than those, too. They called me a legalist. I got to college. A Christian college. They called me a legalist because I said, well, you know, the Bible says, I said, you legalist. Folks, obeying God is not being a legalist. Take your definition of legalism from what God says is legalism, not from what the world has redefined it as being. Just because you have personal standards, and you refuse to smoke or drink or take drugs or fornicate with them, they call you a legalist. But God has established the standards that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if you defile the temple of God, God will destroy you. You're not being a legalist by standing for what is morally right and pure. I got off subject. Both salvation and sanctification are by faith and faith alone. Sanctification is also by faith. The Apostle Paul makes that very, very clear in Acts chapter 26, where he says, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are, now listen, sanctified by faith that is in me. Not just your salvation, but your sanctification is also by faith. It's not by works. It's not in the power of the flesh. It's in the Spirit of God. That's where true Christian liberty is found. Well, there's much more that I would like to say on this subject, but I think that that should do it for today. Our time is up. Remember where we began. Remember it well when you're accused of being a legalist or attempted to be a libertine. Three things. The first system where we saw the contrast, flesh versus the spirit. The spirit. That's the contrast between the two principal empowerments. Your first key word is empowerments. Flesh versus spirit, empowerments that struggle for supremacy in the Christian life and our pursuit of freedom. The second system was works versus faith. That's a contrast between the two principal means that people follow in their pursuit of salvation or sanctification. First. What are you relying on for the power to get you through? 
Secondly, what is the means that you're attempting to use to get you through? The third system was law versus grace. That's a contrast between the two principal motivations that people follow in their desire to be justified and sanctified. What is it that motivates you? Is it, man, I'm a law keeper. I'm going to obey every little picky thing about law that I can think of. Or are you motivated by the grace of God in that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. There is love that's being poured out your direction. Will you respond to that love? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that what motivates you? I hope it does. That's the most powerful motivator in the world. People die for others whom they love. They give everything that they have for those whom they love. They'll stand under any torture for those whom they love. Or is it, well, the law doesn't require this of me, so I'm not going to do it. Or the law requires me of this, so that's what I'm going to do. You know, nitpicky kind of stuff. What is your motivation? Law or grace? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free in Christ. Free from the law of sin and death. Not free to do what you want, but free to do what you ought. Free to serve Christ in the power of the Spirit of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power and for the freedom the true freedom that we have in Christ. All around us, the world talks about freedom. And what they mean is licentiousness. What they mean is immorality. What they mean is no restraints. What they mean is doing their own thing. They do not understand freedom. Because we're only free when we're doing what you designed us to do. But the flesh can't empower us to do that. Only the Spirit of God can give us that empowerment. And it's only as we know the truth our Lord Jesus Christ and his word that were set free. Father, I pray for everyone who is here or who is listening to this broadcast that they might know the truth and that the truth might set them free. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 807.